Conference recording started. Hey guys, this is Grandmaster Jerry Fassi Fontanez. In a few minutes, a few seconds, we're going to have one of the greatest fighters of all time. Again, Keith Vitale, we're going to continue with this conversation. And what's so interesting is that Vitale, again, was a gentleman that I looked up to reading in the magazines. You know, he was a top um, number one fighter for three years in a row. He, um, he, he trained with Master Joe Corley. You know, he actually was the, the person that, that I learned by reading his magazine how to do fadeaway side kicks and hook kicks and swing kicks and so on and so forth. Tonight, we, I, I, you know, he's, he's being really super nice by sharing this information. We had a little challenge in the initial um, recording, but I believe Vitaly is on the phone again. Are you there, sir? <laughs> yes, I am. Hey, hey, Jerry. All right, so we were talking about how Bobby Tucker had beat you a total of 10 times before, I guess, you started beating him. Right, well, what happened was this. Mike Jenner and I decided to go down to Florida for a tournament. We went down. I beat Hank Farah, might beat somebody in the finals. And it was such a wonderful experience to go out of the state, fly someplace, and then we compared our talent to other people's talent. And um, it was really nice, so we enjoyed it. On the plane back, Mike and I had an idea. And, uh, and here was the idea. We said, why don't we start the national circuit? Why don't we call some local tournament pr- promoters and get the national circuit going? Are you still there, Jerry? Sir, I am putting you on – I'm putting myself on mute, but the answer is yes, the entire time I am here. Okay, good. Okay, so here's what happens. So we're, we're on the plane. And uh, so Mike and I, we were talking, and I said, what if I called up, for example, what if I called up uh, John Worley, the people at Diamond Nationals? What if I called those guys up and just say, listen, we'll come out there, and um, if they invite other number ones and, and other regions to come out to the Diamond Nationals? So I went home. We thought it was a good idea, so I went back. I picked up the phone. I found John Worley's number. Um, I called him up, we spoke, and he said, Keith, I think it's a great idea. He goes, here's the thing. We've had this local tournament for years. We're going to give away a diamond ring, a gold ring with a diamond in it. He said, we'd love to have you come out with Bobby, Bobby Tucker and Richard Jackson, Mike Geneva. Why don't you guys come out? He says, what if you guys win? It, it really gives it a national, you know, national look versus a, a regional tournament. We said, fine, just let everybody know. I said, but please, call other regionals number one. Tell them that I'm coming out because I'm number one in my region, and I'm probably easy to beat. I said, it's not a big deal. So by beating me, they're going to build up their reputation. And I I told everybody that. So we get down there, and uh, we walk in the tournament, and it's huge. I mean, you know how these guys are. Phenomenal event. Just thousands of people. Gigantic tournament. So we walk in and they have a diamond ring in a case. I walk up to the diamond ring. It's right on the main floor. And I said, would you mind if I see it? The guy opens up the case. I put the diamond ring on. I turn around. There's so many people there. And I hold it up and I go, it fits. It fits. I take it off. I put it back in there. And I took pictures of that. And so when I was fighting my ring, I'm fighting guys. A lot of the guys back then just started wearing headgear. And I have never fought headgear in my life. So anyway, I go through everybody. I just go through everybody. I get to the final, or I get to the final night, and it's Mike Jenner and I against two others. And I said, Mike, we'll share this. Just get your get through your guy, and I'll get through mine. And um, the guy that beat him, I ended up having to fight in the finals, and so I end up winning. So I win the diamond ring. I win the money. I come back home. I pick up the phone. The next day, I call Roy Kerbin for Texas. Texas, you know, had the program there. I said, How would you like to make your your tournament? a national tournament. He goes, Keith, he says, I'm way ahead of you. He says, I heard you won that Diamond National. He said, we'd love to have you come out. Why don't you bring your Southern team up? He said, I said, here's the thing. I said, can you call other number ones up? Oh, you, by the way, in the first tournament, that first one, I beat four other regional number ones that night. So by him bringing all hey, that support in the Let's mention national, those guys. Come on, let's do it. Because, again, as a fan, I read about it, and I can guess who they are. But let's get some specifics if you remember. I, I actually don't right now. Uh, I mean, but I remember, I just remember four others, four others from four different regions, Ron Carini, and there's, there's others, you know. But anyway, I think the four of the other number ones are four, four regions. So then I called Roy Kerber, like I said, and Roy, he, he's ahead of the curve. He's funny. He said, Keith, he'd love to have you come down. If you win this tournament, it's no longer a regional tournament. It's a national tournament. 
Love to have you come down. And I said, well, here, can you do me a favor? Can you call other number ones in regions and just tell them I'm easy to, probably going to be easy to beat. Just, he just started giggling. He goes, I hear your strategy. I said, no, it's not a strategy. He goes, yes, it is. He goes, I'll let them know you're coming. And I kind of giggled because I want them to think they can beat me. So I get down there and I come in. I have the same effect and, and, uh, and I'm fighting in Texas. And as I, as I win my division, I, I, you know, I beat Tommy Williams, Norris Williams. There was a bunch of famous guys there I beat. And so I make it, uh, I make it to the finals that night. And, um, God, it was phenomenal. But I remember one year fighting in Texas. When I was fighting in Texas, Roy Kerbin was working the microphone. We don't have fight-offs between the divisions in Texas. It was just too rough. It, it was really – you could not believe how tough the Texas fighters were. Knocking out people. I knocked out D.P. Hill in the finals with a round kick, a front-leg round kick, knocked him out. I got it on film, and all the flags go up. And then I walk around. I look at him unconscious. I walk back, look in the camera and smile. I won that fight. You know, there's no other region where they gave you points for knockout except in Texas. So anyway, I'm fighting that night, and I'm fighting somebody for the finals in my weight division, and I got up like seven to one on them. So now I'm really up. I'm, I should be winning the grand champion of the, this tournament. But um, Ray McCall was fighting, and he's fighting somebody, Steve Fisher. And as he's fighting, Roy Kerbin's going, judges, judges. He said, my tally's still three points up on Ray, Medell- Ray McCallum. And then Ray would, and then he go, he's only two up. He only needs one more point to match Keith Vitale. And then he only needs one more point. And, you know, and he kind of egged it on. And I loved it, but I was like, and then he ended up winning the grand champion. But he never fought me, but he won the grand champion because he got more points than me that night. But, no, those, those were good times. But anyway, Mike and I, we started talking to different promoters. And then the next year, all of a sudden, there was, there was a national circuit of tournaments. And when the ratings came out, I was rated number one. And that's what did it. You know, that's what started it right there. Wow, phenomenal. This is something that Karate Illustrated, I believe, was recognizing it, and that's what changed the game. You was number one fighter in Region 10. And, you know, and, and during that time, it was sad for me to say that Region 11 wasn't representative of the Nationals. It took many years after until right. I actually Did started right? coming out. I was like, what the heck? You know, New York had their own little world and tournaments, and, I was, and they all thought they were the best. And I said, you know what? I, when I got rated number one in Region um, 11, I said, I'm going to check, I'm going to test my skills to see if I'm really fitting good because these guys that's say we're the best. Them. Excuse me? That's right. No, <laughs> and that's, that's the whole game. And these guys, they're all the same way. I mean, on a given day, on a given Sunday. Now, even like with Bobby Tucker, I, I ended up finding Bobby Tucker in a full contact match. And I ended up beating them in a full contact match. It was, a, it was right then they had that first full contact match that everybody saw, those ones in California. And that's what Wallace, Lewis, Jeff Smith, they all won. And that's the picture everybody always sees when they won the first one. Well, I fought the second one ever. And the second one was in Columbia, South Carolina. And it was Bruce Bucci, myself. It was Mike Geneva and Jerry Rome. We fought the very first card in the South. And I fought Bobby Tucker. Now, Bobby Tucker's beat me eight, ten times. And I'm not with Corley at the time. So Corley and Sam Chapman just hated us from Columbia. I mean, really hated us. And so they thought they were going to set me up by getting knocked out by Bobby Tucker. It was reverse. I, I handled Bobby pretty good. So when I went down to get my money up, um, Mike Geneva knocked out Sam Chapman. He was supposed to lose. Bruce Bruce did lose. But Mike and I went down to pick our money up after the fight. And Sam Chapman and Joe Corley were in the room. They threw the money at me, and he said, yeah, he said, Vitaly, this is Joe Corley. He said, Vitaly, you surprised me. He said, but guess what? You'll never beat Bobby Tucker, ever. And I was thinking to myself, thank you for saying that. Thank you so much for saying that, because I'm going to fight him one time he's not seated. Because, you know, I've, I've got to fight all these fights. Tucker's so fast. So the next tournament we fought, he wasn't seated. I beat him seven to one. And then I beat him the next nine times. I beat him ten in a row. And I beat him, but the ten I beat him were all for, like, championships, all for, like, national tournaments. I would beat him before and then go into the final match. And I always felt bad. Bobby talked about it. If it wasn't for me, he might have been the best fighter of all time because he, nobody could handle his speed. It was just phenomenal. I had just spent so much time working with him and fighting him that, that I, you know, and the way I, 
originally got a chance to be, be able to beat him was he drove down to my house. We were great friends. We did, we would go to the tournaments together, if you can believe it, back then. He was from Greenville, South Carolina. I'm from Columbia. He'd drive two hours in, pick me up, and we would go with Mike Jenner. We, we would travel together to tournaments. One day he comes over to my house. And I said, Bobby, what are you doing here? And it's like a Wednesday night. And uh, he goes, Vitaly says, you're fighting a lot of full contact. And by then I was like 5-0 and o at the time. He says, but here's the thing. This is before I beat him. He says, you're never going to beat me unless I, I work with you. I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're, just, you're telegraphing all your techniques. He said, let me show you some things. So we went outside in my apartment at the time. I'm in college. And we go outside in my apartment, and he starts showing me techniques, and he just blew me away with his speed. I mean, literally, he could have been in the circus. He's the fastest human being on this planet. You know, I fought flush, you know, Eddie Newman. I fought fast people, and I'm telling you, Bobby Tucker was it was so much faster than any human being. Just, hey, hey, wait a second. You just called him flush. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's our buddy. Yeah, we're talking about Grandmaster Flash today. They call him. But well, yeah. I'm sorry. Back then, we had a rival going. We had a rival going. I know. But, it was the kickings versus the punches. I remember reading the article. Yeah, and he would always give me a hard time at tournaments. You know, he had he had Alvin Prowler and all these guys, and, and, and they had Nancy Anderson. They'd always have to get around them, and they'd be calling me names. I'd laugh. I'd go, quit holding them back. Let them go. Let him yeah, West, West Coast versus East Coast, kickers versus punches, phenomenal right. times, huh? Well, let me tell you what, you better believe it. These guys had dash punches. They were they were so good with the punches. But I remember fighting them. We, I fought them in the PK Nationals. And so I had to fight uh, Eddie Newman. And uh, and I just had his number. I just really had his number. He, I don't know, I could just, I saw the way he would dash, he would explode, and he gave it away. So every time he'd give it away, I, I would stick him. So I probably beat him, I don't know, 5-1, five 5-2, one, five whatever. But anyway, for about a year, two years, he kept on saying, I never scored on him. It was a rough deal. I never scored on him. I would say, Flush. He goes, man, that, he goes, my name is Flush. I go, Flush. I said, congratulations. You're the only guy I ever fought where I never missed with a technique. And he gets so mad. And then his guys would start talking trash to me. Oh, yeah, he said, whip your ass. I'm going, well, let him go. Let him go. I don't care. And so, but here was this. When I won the last fight I won, it was, it was in Oakland. And I remember I beat uh, Ray McCallum three to nothing that night. And, you know, I, I just, I was so on. I was just so on. But it was my, it was my time. I had told everybody I was retiring that night. So everybody made the big, they made an announcement. This is my last tournament. And so I went up to, I, went, you know, I let McCallum know. I said, it's going to be three O's. Nothing he can do about it tonight. I was just that, that on. So at the end of the tournament, Ray McCallum, Nasty Anderson, and Eddie Newman picked me up on their shoulders and walked me around the arena. As the announcers, are, and everybody's clapping in the stands, this huge clap. I was like in shock going, these guys are the ones who hate me. I mean, no, they hate me. And yet they were showing me more respect than, than I would ever, ever thought it was, was even warranted. And then Eddie Newman hugged me. And he goes, hey, Keith. I said, what? He goes, you know those sidekicks? He says, you never miss me. Man, those suckers hurt. <laughs> he said, you hit me with all of them. <laughs> I laugh. You, 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 know, you know something? That's what's missing today with the psychological warfare of the competitors. Now, without trying to beat everybody up, the fact of the matter is that when I used to Coming from New York City, New York was a hardcore place. They'll sweep you, they'll stomp you. You're right. And, and, oh, yeah. and that's just the way it was. Now, I, they give me a lot of credit for being the guy who revolutionized the industry, at least in New York, because I was doing techniques that your guys were doing. I was mimicking the, the hand positions, not knowing that they were groin kicks. And then I started going to New England area just to get good at groin kicks. And my first national tournament that I competed in and took first place in fighting in forms, as a peewee or junior, I should say, was the U.S. Open in, in 81. So I was that guy who wanted to be in the magazines because I thought whoever was in the magazine was rich. <laughs> so I wanted to be rich. You know? and, right. But what was really interesting was that, you know, we, my, my generation got shafted. Now, some of my peers, a uh, student of yours, of course, Jerry Prince and a bunch of people that, you know, Stacey Duke and, 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 and guys like that. I know Hot Dog was around a little before me. But the thing about it was, when the Karate Illustrated and Black Boss got away from Point Karate and we didn't get the covers, it made things a little hard, a little uncomfortable. You know, if you can mention 
what what I would consider that your, your three favorite nemesis. I think you already said them already, but just to get specific. And then I want to fast forward a little bit to to 1988, only because at that time you came on, and I'm talking about this is a personal time, and I actually got a chance to meet you, and and you was also coach for a while with us. So first, the three people that you would, that probably stick out the most. Well, Bobby Tucker's number one. He was the fastest. I had 20 fights with him, 10 and 10, and just a great friend. Uh, the second one would be Ray McCallum, who I thought was the single most talented fighter of almost all time. He was the most versatile. The, the thing he didn't really have was the speed factor. He wasn't the quickest, but, my gosh, he was electrifying. He, he was so dynamic watching fighting that I remember having the top fighters in the nation all watching his ring at one of the Diamond National fights, and we sat there all clapping watching him, and he did three moves. I've never seen a martial arts when I saw him do them, and I've never seen them, and to this day, nobody has tried those moves in martial arts ever again. I've never seen anybody do what that man did, and I remember all of us were like clapping and high-fiving. There's John Longstreet and Mike Genova, and there's there's uh, Dan Anderson. We high five each other, and we're all excited. And then it hit us. Somebody's got to fight that man in a few minutes. Oh, my God. He was just – he was a bad-ass, tough-to-the-bone, kick-your-ass, bite you in the – I mean, he was, he was just the toughest guy you'll ever want to fight. And um, so that, that's probably the second one. I, I, you know, I never actually had the third one in my mind. There were so many other talented ones, Robert Harris. Uh, he was talented. There were so many of the top ten. I mean, all the top ten were talented. But probably, if I had to say my favorite would probably be Dan Anderson because Dan Anderson would have, was a mirror image of myself. And, you know, I think I, I beat him three or four times. He beat me once. But it was a battle royale each time because we both had left leg, right leg. We both could – I mean, it was like – and it was just nonstop. And when I fought Bobby Tucker, I remember all the judges would try to get out. Because the judges would say, and I'd listen, we, Bobby and I would laugh about this, the judges would go, our eyes aren't fast enough to, ju- to judge this match. And the, and the promoters would go, but somebody's got to judge it. And they go, but our eyes aren't fast enough. We can't call, we can't call points on these guys. And Bobby My was like God. a machine gun. He'd be, bop, 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 bop. But this one quick story, talking about competition before we go, you know, we go back into the future. I, was, I fought uh, Norris Williams, who's no longer with us. I fought in Oklahoma. And I fought... Uh, all these guys, I mean, just they were all just tough. I mean, just you couldn't imagine the toughest guys in the world from Texas and Oklahoma. I had fought them all. But Norris Williams was a full contact fighter, world champion at the time. So I'm fighting him. And I just beat the guy, uh, Williams, who just – remember, he's, he's the black gentleman who beat uh, Benny Yurkidis in a full contact match. Um, you know, so I just finished beating him. Uh, I beat that was Billy, Billy Jack Jackson. All of them, by the way, most of those people were students of rest in peace, Demetrius the Greek Havanas. Right. So I beat him. And I, I remember because every time I would fake him, he'd do a hook, and the hook would just barely miss me. And I'd go, my gosh, if he'd hit me, I would have died. But, you know, back then I was number one in the country, so I'm supposed to beat these guys. And I did beat these guys. So now I make it to the finals and find Norris Williams. And um, I'm handling pretty easy. And it's probably five to one, something like that. And with just a few seconds to go, he does his famous technique, a spin and back fist, and he catches me flush on my face. Now, Richard Jackson was the best spin and back fister in the world. He was my student. I couldn't do it like him, but he knocked off everybody he fought with spin and back fist. And we had it down to a science. I mean, I've been hit by his spin and back fist. But anyway, Norris Williams from Texas or Oklahoma, he spun and caught my – because I have a skinny neck, and he caught it perfect and flush. You wouldn't believe it. And then the referee goes, time. And I remember we stood there to bow each other, and I looked at him, and I said, you hit like a frigging girl. He's the F word. I said, you hit like a, like a frigging girl. And we bowed each other, and I walked away. So no big deal. A year later, I'm at an event. He walks over to me at an event. He goes, Keith, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah, hey, Tommy, how you doing? Uh, it's been Tommy Williams, not Norris Williams. Tommy, I beat Norris Williams in Texas, but this was Tommy Williams, the world champion fighter. <clears throat> Excuse me for all the Williams. But anyway, Tommy Williams, a world champion fighter, just a great technician. Famous for a spin of access. So he w- walks up to me at the event. We start talking. I said, well, what's up? He goes, remember when I fought you last year? 
I, I said, yeah. He says, well, you beat me. And I said, he, he goes, I hit you with a spin and back fist harder than I've ever hit anybody in my entire life. And you looked at me and called me a girl. I said, Tommy, this is a true story. When I did that, I couldn't hear or see. I looked in the general direction. I was hoping you were standing there because I was totally almost knocked out on my feet. I remember just looking in that direction going, you hit like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even know. I didn't even know if you were standing in front of me, but there was something inside my body that said, don't let you get the best of me now. He picked me up when I told him that story, and he laughed so hard. He picked me up, and he goes, oh, my God, I thought I lost my mojo. I thought I lost my power. He said, oh, well, my rest God. in peace to Tommy Williams. He did pass yeah. away. Sad to hear, but he did. Yeah, I'm, he did. Sure, he's, I'm he did. sure he's smiling right now. <laughs> he is, and we had beers at night. I said, Tommy, you hit me harder than any human being can hit anybody. I said, it was a phenomenal technique. And he just laughed. He goes, thank you so much for telling me the story. I thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> oh, wow. That, that, that's a great story. And listen, just to be fair, as a competitor, you did some wonderful stuff. We know that. But as an instructor, oh, my God. Rest in peace to Vernon Johnson. Let's talk about some of those students that you had, John Walker, and all these oh, yeah. guys. Come on. Yeah. So just this, I have two heavyweights. John Ork, who's – get this. John Ork was my roommate in college. And he always – he was an all-American linebacker from college, all-American. So when we would fight, he would try to grab me and headbutt me. And I'd go, John, stop it. We're not in football. Stop it. And, you know, 200-some pounds, just vicious. But find these big guys help. Vernon Jackson, Vernon Johnson, two forty six four, as fast as me, lightning. But he had this his hook kicks were better than mine, and he was phenomenal. John Ork and Vernon Johnson fought each other a bunch of times. They're both my students. Both of them were top ten in the nation. Both had top ten ratings in the national ratings. I couldn't be more impressed. More, I, I just love both of them. But anyway. But when I left Columbia, where I trained John Ward, South Carolina, I went to work for Joe Corley, and that's where I had Vernon. Vernon fought nasty three times, beat nasty three times. That's how good John Ork is. I'm sorry, John, uh, uh, Vernon Johnson was. And then I had Charles Fears, Michael Goldman, who was the top ten in the nation. I had uh, Richard Jackson, who was number one contender, beat everybody. Mike Bill, you name it, in the spinning back fist, knocking people. Just phenomenal fighter. I had um, um, Farmer. Jeff Farmer won the won, uh, Battle of Atlanta. I had Stacey Duke, Jerry Prince. Jerry Prince won five Battle of Atlanta, won five, won five Men America, the Down the Nationals, whatever they call it. Five of those. He was, but he would do it in forms fighting. I had Tony Bell. No, I'm sorry, Tony Young. Tony Bell's a student too, but Tony Young was one of my students. Now think about having Tony Young. Vernon Johnson, Charles Sears, um, Jeff Farmer, I mean, Jerry Prince. Uh, it was a who's who. And then I had so many, Stacey Duke, I had Rhonda Alexander. And what it was was I had a thousand kick drill, and I just had so many drills that I put myself through that I, I told my students that before they would allow them to fight, they had to go through my classes and drills. And I get this, we had fight nights, and we had people from all over the country who would come into the to the South because of the Battle of Atlanta, and I had them all. You, you could, I couldn't name how many people came to visit me. Just all, and we treated them wonderful. They come as guests, and we would work out with them, and, and everyone said the same thing, going, my gosh, this is harder, harder than any national tournament, just having a, a Wednesday workout or a Friday night workout at your school. It was, it was tough. I'm so proud of hey, that. I just want to make sure we don't forget one of the greatest of all time students of yours from South Carolina, Joey Shiflett. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, he's my Geneva student. Now, I've trained oh. with him for years, but he's actually my Geneva student. And, okay. Uh, well, you know why? He still gives you credit for helping him a lot. Yeah. Well, we, we tra- well he was a white boy when I worked with him and Mike, and we worked with him and worked with him and worked with that boy, and he was just a natural. Do you know he's still winning today? He's still entering tournaments and winning This today. is my he's point. Well, how uh, about this? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to interview a guy that you haven't mentioned, but now when I mention it, you're going to remember this guy beat a gentleman by the name of Toki Hill in the 1981 U.S. Open. He had a, the mustache just like Vernon Johnson at the time, and his name is Marty Knight. Oh, yeah. I forgot about Marty. How can I forget Marty Knight? Oh, my goodness. 
And Marty, look at everything he's won. I mean, he you know Marty won two hundred tournaments without being without losing a fight, a stretch of two hundred tournaments. And again, quite a few. He had Karen Cook. He had you know uh, whether it was Brenda Hun, now Brenda Lee, or formerly Brenda Lee, and also Nikki right. Lee. So right. so not counting all the men that that he had. So when it's all said and done, a nice whether it's you and or Corley and um, I'm gonna interview Mr. Ben Kaika. If you take Kaika and your guys, we're talking about a lot of incredible martial arts pioneers and legends, huh? Oh, I love fighting Kaika guys. They all dressed in yellow, and I was with the Corley guys, and we had our schools, and, and we had our grays, and it was always it was it was it was it was competition like it should be. It was so heated. They would have a hundred people on the, on, the, on the side of the ring screaming, and yelling for their fighters. I had my group of guys, and we loved it, just loved it. I fought all those guys so many times. You know, for me, we just loved the rivalry. I, I, you know, I remember my gentleman, I walked up to Robert here. I said, Robert, I'm tired of fighting you. I said, why don't you go with me to a, to a national circuit? I said, you're so good. Come with me someplace. So he tried his first national. First year, he was top ten, like number four or five in the country. He was, he, he was just phenomenal. Hey, you're going to get a kick out of this. I just interviewed Jesse Thornton a few days ago. And I also actually made his website, right? So Jesse Thornton, of course, one of the brothers of the entire operation that went out there nationally also. And what, what, what he did was he gave me the phone number for Mr. Robert Rich Ham Harris and also Mr. Kaika. So God willing, this week coming, those two gentlemen will be part of the oh, old yeah. time. 300 people. This is the deal, just so you know. I love the movie The 300. So I said, if I went to war and I had an opportunity to pick my 300, who would it be? And Mr. Vitali, you're one of those people. And that's the reason why I, I appreciate it that you took this call. And I know that you wake up early. So I do want to be respectful of your time. But if you don't mind just sharing a little bit more because I think this is very important. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Maybe I'm wrong. But has it been a while since you've been interviewed or have you been interviewed recently? I've been interviewed recently. I, I've had a few. Okay. Because it saddens me, not in your case, but in the case of a lot of people. As an example, you saw me, and we had a chance to um, obviously break bread and have some fun at the Battle of Atlanta this year. I got interviewed twice that day for two different video magazines, and when they were walking towards me, they passed a bunch of people that I looked up to. And I'm like, what the heck? They don't even know those people. So I'm committed to letting people know the truth because we are all extended family members as dysfunctional as any family. And I think that it's important that people know that we're standing on the shoulders of the giants. And my commitment to just share the truth is what this is all about. I started this back in, 19, in 2009. Um, if you, if you, when you get a chance to go to the Dojang, you will hear your name pop up a few times. Um, I, I got Corley. I have um, from, from six years ago, I got Ray McCallum on there. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of people that, um, again, extended family members of us in the martial arts, and I think it's very important that we keep this information out there. You went over from an instructor to a coach for a little while, 1988. We finally meet Jesse, I should say, um, Jesse Thornton, Jerry Prince, uh, Marty Eubanks, Ken Eubanks, rest in peace, and a bunch of people on this little team for a little while. And then we hear that Keith Vitale is going to be a coach. And I was like, oh, my God. The only time I had seen you fight before that in person was against, rest in peace, William Oliver at the PK show at Madison Square Garden Felt Forum. Right, right. I enjoy that, too. He's such a great guy. I I love fighting him. He was such a, a wonderful gentleman. Well, I, incredible. To me, he was the best powerful pound fighter from New York because he was a very small guy with long legs. But this is my question. Um, and, and, and this is a personal one. This is the first time you met. What did you think of what was happening during that time? Because um, <laughs> the legend was coming on board. Well, you. I, you know, and, and to prerequisite just a little bit, I was very fortunate because Today, people don't even know who Bill Wallace, Joe Lewis. Some some people don't know who Jackie Chan. They don't even know who you know Chuck Norris. You know, it, it's just like you're right. I mean, that's why we appreciate and respect someone like you that's out there trying to promote, especially people like myself. I was fortunate 
because I was on a lot of different magazine covers. And back then, they covered the tournaments. And for those that won tournaments, you got a lot of play in the tournament as well as covers. But those covers last forever. They make you immortal. And, you know, all these years later, Bill Wallace goes all over the world and he goes, Keith, they don't know. There's like 20 number ones in the nation. Nobody knows who anybody is, but they still remember you. They still remember you know, Joe Lewis. And I remember when Wallace told me that. I was so amazed. He goes, because all your magazine covers. People remember the magazines and all the covers you did. So I, I was really – I was very fortunate to fight when I did. And I was honored to be chosen as a coach of the team going to Puerto Rico. And when I saw these fights, I had – Believe it or not, I was I had been to some other tournaments, and so I had a chance to watch you fight and others fight, and I, I kept up with it, you know. So I I knew we had a talented team. I know our guys. What I I love about our guys were they they were electric. They were not standstill fighters, and you were also versatile. None of you fall from one side. You fall where I see today. There's there's no combinations. Whereas back then there was combinations. There was hands setting up feet or feet setting up hands. There's combinations, and it's the combinations that make you so versatile because that's how you fool your opponent. Nobody knows what's coming. But when you pick up your leg and bounce, well, you see a leg coming. And if you get hit with that, you're, you're, you're a fool because why would you be hit by a kick? You've studied for three, all these years. But what you, that team had, there were so many talented people on the team like you and Jesse and especially Jerry Prince. My gosh, you see what Jerry did at the end. You know, so I knew I had a good team. And I – and. I wasn't at the mindset where I go, oh, my our guys were much better fighters than you guys. I thought our fight, our era, right after the Joe Lewis and all those eras, our eras came next. I thought our era impacted and influenced and inspired yours. And we were happy with it because you guys were great fighters. We had a bunch of great fighters out there. Thompson, all you guys were like just awesome. It's well, let, 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 me, let me tell you what I believe. Let me tell you what I believe. And I may be wrong. I, I coined this phrase a few years ago. I believe that after the golden era was the platinum era. We had the blood and guts era, the golden era, and the platinum era in martial arts. From 1976 to 1988 was the ending of it, was the platinum era. And the reason I say that is because the diversity that you just mentioned. Because remember, your guys could fight with or without groin kick. And you can sweep with the best of them while kicking and punching also. And today, the rules do not allow a nice chunk of those techniques even today. Right. Do you know, if you watch my fight, for example, what makes a good fighter like Wallace is Wallace will tell you this. I've got a left leg. I'm going to hit you in the head with it. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And you go, wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. What about his right leg? What about all the – no. I only have one leg, and there's nothing you can do about it. And, and we were the same. I felt like I was almost the same way. I thought this guy is on YouTube. I'm finding this guy, Smith, and it's the one where I sweep him. It was, a, it was the one on ESPN. And it really helped when I fought on ESPN because millions got a chance to see me fight. And it's the one where I'm fighting the guy, and I just notice when I go back and look from time to time, it's the guy I'm in a red satin. He, no matter what I do, he's trying to kick me in the groin. Every move I make, he's kicking me in the groin. Yet, he never kicks me in the groin, yet I hit him in the head over and over. And what I took pride was, even though there's groin kicks in my era, I, the way we set up our hands, we would back fist or punch first, so you have to respond to the punch, and then the kick would come. We didn't pick our leg up, or we would just get groin kicked. And your era followed ours, and you guys were versatile. Billy Blanks, all you guys had left, you had both hands, both feet. There was nobody stood still. There was nobody that you go, oh, that's the only thing he has. You had to be worried about everything from everybody, and I love that. Let's see here. That makes sense? Yes, sir. Sorry. You know what it is? I, just to be um, um, part of, I, I put you on mute. I put myself on mute. Um, yeah, that, that, that's the whole thing there. As a spectator, this is what I noticed that was a big difference as a fan, which is I think I'm, I might be one of the top two fans of all time to sport karate, um, or as they call it, point karate or, or tournament karate. Um, no one fought exactly the same. Everybody right. had their own style. Even people from the same school had similar but different. The only thing that was consistent was that they were going to hit you with a whole bunch of stuff. And that's <laughs> right. missing. 
However, there was a time where, um, and, and you was actually one of the judges, a gentleman by the name of Brian Ruth who came in from a, uh, he was from the 1980s as a young kid. He was beating the crap out of a bunch of people, and 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 then I ended up fighting him. And and he was um, and I think if I remember correctly, there was a statement that I I at least there's rumor I have it that you made a, you made two statements. One statement was when Brian Ruth beat up the I believe the Korean guy that hit me before that. You mentioned something about how you wasn't sure if you could have beat him. I don't know if that's the truth. But and then when after I fought him and I believe I did a few techniques of yesteryear, then you said, "Oh no!" Then I think I could have beat him because I think the setups are different. Now I might be wrong, but my point is that could you tell the difference between generations there? Yeah, I don't remember any of that. I do remember the fights you guys were fighting. I remember how good Brian was. He was very versatile too. I remember this is so good. I put we put Brian in a movie. And uh, and I'm the bad guy to move in, and I put him in it because he was so talented with weapons. Is why I put him in, really. And he did a bow in this movie. But I remember he, I said he'd like to work out a little bit, and he looked at me like I was speaking Spanish. And so we started throwing kicks, and I kicked him in the head, and he said, "Oh my God, you can kick for an old man." <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, you know something? Let, let, okay, let, let, let's parlay into that. So now all of a sudden, Keith Vitale is in this movie called Meals on Wheels or Spartan Max, and, 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 and he looks like a giant, of course, because everybody else is that much shorter, including, including <laughs> Ben Nikita. Let's talk about that particular um, – that's a legendary movie for more reasons than one. But let's talk about that experience going over to Asia. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. Pat Johnson, you know, he's – He's a, a great fighter back, and he was with. A, he's a black belt uh, with Chuck Norris, and uh, very famous at the time. And he's a, a fight choreographer. Anyway, he called me up on a Thursday, and he said, "Would you like to be in a movie with Jackie Chan?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Do you have a passport?" I went, "Great, I, I do." He goes, "He says we're flying out tomorrow, and uh, he says we're going to Spain for three months." I was on that plane going to Spain for three months, and that's when I ran into Benny Yakitas. There, I had known him already. Uh, I had met him in another movie, the first movie I, I did, Force One. I saw him out there, and uh, it was wonderful. Three months, Benny and I would fight, train together. We'd go to gyms together. Benny taught me how to do leg kicking. You know, taught me how to block legs. I mean, it was phenomenal. What a great experience. Get a chance to work out, you know, spend time with Samuel Hung and Bong Yu and, and all these great guys. And uh, Jackie Chan was wonderful, just wonderful. So it, it didn't get any better than that. Uh, what a three month great experience. And then I believe shortly after that, you were doing some other movies. When was the relationship with you and Keith Strasberg? Because I know there was a, there was a nice little uh, bunch of years that you guys were doing all types Yeah. Of and we're still best friends. Still best friends to this day. And um, I, I started working for a company, it was those kicking those shields. You know, and they had a piezo film inside, and it registered the amount of force. And I was the person that they hired. The to, impact pad. That's it, impact with Barry French. And I was the one that would go around, and I'd go to the tournament. That's where I saw you fight so many times. I'd go, I'd go up north, I'd go to Cleveland, go all the way up to New York, Boston. We went everywhere. Keith Strandberg at the time was the writer for the company. I was the person they used to, to display the techniques and show the techniques and sell the techniques around the country. So we started that way. And then Keith, uh, we started doing films. He had, you know, he did the first No Retreat, No Surrender with Van Damme. And then he put me in a movie, the third one with Lauren uh, uh, Avedon. Phenomenal, just great experience. And then I did Secret Fights with him. I did Blood Moon with Gary Daniels. So we did a, and then he would do movies and I would do my own we go back and forth, um, but we developed a great relationship, and our families are, are close together. Our kids are close, you know, so it was a wonderful experience. Wow. So, sir, listen, I'm going to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate you, but I do want to ask you one last question. Will it be okay. possible in the future for us to have another power talk to just continue on this? Because there's been so many wonderful memories here, a lot of historical facts, and I want to thank you for your time. I do want to, in the future, like I said, just ask you some more questions. And um, Wonderful. 
you know, I have an opportunity now to, to live my dream, to speak to people who I always looked up to, and um, you're one of them, sir. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Any last words from you? Uh, thank you, Jerry. I just respect you so much. You're a great fighter, and now I respect you even more that you're out there trying to promote sport karate and also the old timers and I, and some of the the great fighters, and hopefully to make a difference. And the difference will be felt in the new generation of sport fighters because of people like you. All right, buddy. Thank you so much for having thank me you. on your. Hey, one podcast. second. Right. Now this is a this is a sign off. When I say A B, you have to say C you. And the crazy and the and the famous words of some crazy Puerto Ricans from the Bronx. When I say A B, you say C you. A B, C you. <laughs> thank you very much. So have a wonderful time. Bye bye. You too. Bye.
Yeah, what about 